Okay, thank you very much. So this is your brain, or one of them. Um, everybody has one. The, uh, some bigger, some better than others, presumably. Uh, it takes up about 2% of your body weight, but it uses about 20% of your body's energy, and yet it's still very efficient. It uses about the same amount of energy as a 20-watt light bulb. Um, it has, contains you know, rough estimate about 100 billion neurons, and each of those neurons is thought to connect to about another 1,000 to 10,000 neurons. And I was just thinking, as you mentioned earlier, a petaflop, it sounds like bad footwear to me, but uh, it seems like with a, a, a topic like this, we could get into a, a, a numerical arms race. So I'll take your petaflop and raise you to, well, actually, it's probably the same number, isn't it? One million billion connections. Um, that is a petaflop, isn't it? Mm, there you go. Uh, OK, there you go. Um, so this is our big story. Uh, this is what we're interested in. The, the question is, how do we study the brain? How do we study something that is as complex as that? Well, one way we can do it is by using functional neuroimaging technology like we have here at the University of Vermont. Uh, what's really exciting, what has really just exploded this field of research over the last uh, decade or two, is that you can now do this non-invasive investigation. You can study the living, breathing human person as they perform your tasks. There's no radiation, no injections, nothing nasty. It's just done with a large magnetic field. And what you can do with that, and this is the interesting part, really is just limited by our creativity. So if you uh, get a research participant in whose brains you might be interested, for example, <laughs> exhibit A, you then really, the sky's the limit as to what you can study. So for example, we could look at something very simple like visual stimulation. If we do this, we will see robust activity in the back of the participant's brain as they're processing that visual stimulus. We might be interested in having them perform a task, we might have them tap their fingers and that will then activate and let us map out the, um, the motor strip in the individual. We might want to then make the task a bit more challenging, a bit more cognitive. We might want to look at how the brain performs acts of uh, mental calculation as we, as we saw earlier. Um, and then that will start to engage frontal cortex, parietal cortex. We might be interested in language processing. We might give somebody a task like this, is this a word or not? That will engage a whole distinct set of brain regions involved in processing language. We might then want to move beyond the cognitive domain. We might want to study emotional processing in the brain. We might want to present an emotional or evocative stimulus uh, to the individual and, you know, and map out the threat detection, the emotion systems that they have or we might want to present something that's especially salient to this particular individual and map out the reward processing in the brain. So we can do all of this, and, and this is, I think, why this field has taken off, because it's so, there's so much potential there. I mean, it really is limited just by how creative you can get. So you know, if you think about all of the different types of parameters and tasks and stimuli you can present to individuals, you can present the, 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 the cries of a newborn baby to a mother. Um, and try to map out the attachment processes and so on and so forth. So we can, map the, you know, we can map the neuroanatomy of these processes. And once we can do that, then we can start to try to identify the brain correlates of individual differences. Why do people differ in all of these different types of abilities? And then, of course, that can then lead us to ask questions about clinical dysfunction. Why is it that some people have uh, some, you know, let's say, a, a brain basis to some clinical dysfunction that they might have? What's going on? What goes awry with the machinery, if you will? The problem is how do we make sense of all the data collected, and that's of course is the theme of today. How do these millions of individuals' neurons work together to produce coherent behavior? So I thought to give us, uh, to work with an example, that it being close to Halloween, I would start with something that might be especially frightening to many of you. If we, if we talk about the teenage brain, I was just thinking, he's probably not a teenager, but Simpsons has been along so long, he must be a teenager by this stage. Um, also, of course, there are individual differences, so there's great variation amongst teenagers. Uh, some, some you may be proud to have as your son, some maybe not quite so, and I'll leave up to you to decide which. The question, though, the specific question, kind of the, 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 the clinically relevant question, is can we investigate the neurobiology, and in this particular case, underlying the ability to control the behavior? I mean, adolescence is a really interesting and important and critical period. Very many mental health problems surface during the teenage years. You know, think about schizophrenia, or behavior-related problems like drug use. So if we can understand the ability to control behavior, then we might have, you know, we might be able to arrive at profound insights into these individual differences. So for example, with, for example with regards to alcohol, the age at which somebody starts drinking in their teenage years is a very powerful predictor of how likely they are to have alcoholism as an adult. 
So, you know, and the numbers are difficult, but for every six months or so that you can offset the onset of alcohol use as a teenager, there's something like a 10% savings in the likelihood of becoming an alcoholic in, ad in adulthood. So understanding how behavior uh, affects these sorts of behavior as reflected or related to brain function is an important clinical question. So how do we study this? I'm going to tell you about a study that's ongoing uh, back in Europe. Um, what we do in a study like this is we separate the brain into approximately 50,000 separate brain regions, and we give our participant a task. So in this case, our measure of willpower is a very simple motor response inhibition task. Every now and again, you just have to inhibit responding. You have to exercise a control over a prepotent response. And we might do this task for 15 minutes and record data every two seconds or so. So we build up 50,000 time series in the brain. We might then, just to add to the complexity, get some genetic information. So we might get information on 600,000 locations in the DNA where there's, there's variation across individuals. Uh, we obtain about another 3,000 variables on drug use histories, personality measures, neurocognitive abilities, and so on and so forth. And then we do that uh, in the currently, we have about 2,200 participants run on a paradigm. This, this is all, these are all 14-year-olds. For those of you who might be familiar with this type of literature, typical sample sizes in studies like this are about 20. So we have about two orders of magnitude uh, a larger a sample size. Big data. So this is, a, of course, a blessing, but of course a curse. This is a challenge to try to make sense of this. What we can do, though, is simply exploit the fact that we have this many participants. I mean, really, the insights that I'm going to share with you here only come because we have such a rich data set, that we have so many participants. So what we can do, for example, is we can map how different regions of the brain vary across individuals, and we can find networks of brain regions by virtue of the fact that they co-vary together across individuals. So an individual who has high activity in region A and B, another individual might have low activity, and the fact that they co-vary together kind of implies that that may be a network that works together. So we can reduce the complexity of the brain, at least one way of reducing it, is to about seven distinct factors, and they are color-coded there for you. So even though these are all involved in doing the task, this impulse control task, they seem to, the implication is that they're doing different parts of the task, they have different roles in performing the task. What we can do once we understand that, once we can essentially reduce the complexity to a much more manageable seven numbers, um, is we can then see if different regions of the brain are related to different aspects of impulse control. So for example, we mentioned drug use. What we find is that the adolescents, and again, these are all 14, but half of them are already experimenting with drugs, that those teenagers who have already used some drugs or have already used alcohol and nicotine or who have already just used alcohol show actually reduced activity in certain brain regions, so the green area there, bilateral orbital frontal cortex, seems to be involved in impulse control. We find that that area differentiates already at 14 years of age between the kids who are using drugs and kids who aren't. What makes it, I think, especially potentially interesting is that that effect is there in those kids who have had no more than just one to two drinks in their entire lives. So the implication is probably not that this is a consequence of their very minor alcohol exposure, but that it probably reflect, reflects a pre-existing difference, let's say it's impulsivity, that puts them at just elevated risk for trying that first drink. So we're starting to get an insight into some of these early, if you will, biomarkers for risk of a behavior that can then go on and have, obviously, very significant lifetime consequences. Uh, ADHD is another type of impulse control disorder. We find another network is, re is related to it. It's not shown here, it's sort of an error monitoring network. The point, though, is that ADHD and drug use tend to be highly comorbid, but obviously not perfectly so. And what we're seeing here is that different networks underlying this impulse control type of process are related to the different expressions of impulsivity. So some basis on which to neuroanatomically dissociate whether your impulsivity will uh, lead, if you will, to ADHD-like symptoms or whether it'll lead to impulsivity-like symptoms. Finally, we also identify a right frontal network that's associated with better inhibitory control. There are ways of measuring impulse control. Uh, you can get sort of a performance measure. And this network, a distinct network, again, seems to be related to how good you are at this type of task. What's interesting is that activity in that network is also related to variation in the norepinephrine gene. So in norepinephrine, when there's neurochemical systems in the brain, the functioning of that system is related to the levels of activity in this specific uh, set of brain regions, which is then related to your ability to perform this type of task. 
And what's interesting is that the relationship, there's a relationship between the gene and the brain function, and there's a relationship between the brain function and success on the task, but there's no direct relationship between the gene and the performance, if you just look at the statistics, the statistical associations. So essentially what you have is a sort of a chain of associations where genes might confer, uh, you know, say some level of variability in the function of this network, but then of course there are multiple other sources of potential influence on this network, other genes, early environment, other uh, influences. So it's, a, it's obviously a much more complicated system, and I think we can only really get a handle on the complexity by virtue of having large data sets with multiple different types of relevant information. So to conclude, so studying willpower, this at least one specific operalization of it, is doable. I mean, this is a tractable scientific question. As was said earlier, physics is an easier science because it's a hard science. Psychology is a very difficult science because it's a soft science. We have these concepts that are vague, but we can make these concepts at least neurobiologically, neuroanatomically tractable. And to just I guess reiterate that the theme of today's meeting, these large and complex data sets, despite the challenges in making sense of it, an enormous data space like that, they can greatly contribute new insights into how the, you have this interplay between genes, between environment, and between brain function, and how this translates into how we control our behavior. Thank you very much.